what I want to do today is talk about a, an issue which I think has been essentially ignored both in work with children and with adults. Um, and that is that speakers don't always need to know the full conventional meaning of a term in order to use it. A partial meaning can be quite enough. And what I want to do today is show you why I think this. Partial meanings you can find in both adult and child usage. Um, both, in both cases, they rely on contextual information, so the physical and conversational contexts, um, plus any prior common ground in any particular exchange um, in interpreting what the speaker intends to say. Um, so let me give you an example of what counts as a partial meaning. Um, it's a meaning that can range over disparate events, shifting perhaps in each context of use. So in younger children, for instance, you very often find them using open for opening a door, taking the lid off a box, separating two Lego blocks, turning on a light, undoing shoelaces, taking off a coat, um, and so on. Um, the events, the event types here uh, are covered by children's uses that are covered by open, would be covered in adult usage by open for doors and boxes, take off for lids, shoes, clothes, separate for Lego blocks, turn on for lights and taps, in, in English anyway, um, undo for shoelaces, knots, buttons, and so on. So that in fact, what you see is that you've got a whole domain which is mapped very differently for adults uh, than for children. Um, or if you consider children's very early uses of dog, let's say, only for spaniels, where there's a pet spaniel at home, cut only for one particular mug, Car, only for cars seen from above on the street. This was Lois Bloom's daughter. Um, and the initial limitations for children, and I would argue for adults, uh, in production stem from their limited knowledge about particular conceptual domains and how language maps onto them. So uh, what we're seeing is that they don't know enough about the domain to know either exactly what word would be more appropriate or exactly how to apply it in that context. Um, so let me give you some examples of some, a few partial, early partial meanings that I uh, tracked many years ago. Um, the first is uh-oh, which is probably familiar to anyone who's been around a one-year-old. Um, they pick it up very readily. They use it with exactly the right intonation, that is, some disaster has just happened or is about to happen. Um, and it's initially used simply after the fact, applied to all sorts of objects in unfortunate circumstances. Um, but this child then extended it to himself. When he slipped or fell, he would then say, uh-oh. Um, and then he started to produce it in anticipation of unfortunate circumstances. So standing at the head of the stairs, holding a toy, he would say, uh-oh, and then throw it down the stairs. <laughs> so, um, and then a couple of months later, he started to actually use it in word combinations. So, uh-oh, ring, as he spilt Cheerios on the table. Cheerios, of course, were rings. Um, so this is... Um, really very common, and you see this with open, the example I just mentioned, um, and I should point out that some children opt for open and some children opt for door in all these contexts. You can see why they pick on door. Um, so it's used for removing lids, opening boxes, cupboards, separating Lego blocks, taking off a doll's clothes, peeling fruit, an apple or an orange, say, taking off shoes or coat, turning on the light or TV, removing a cap from a pen, and this is extremely common in children between one and one and a half. Um, both of them, in this case, carry the partial meaning of gain access to, because in every case the child is trying to gain access to some object by doing this action which they characterize as open or door. Um, but these clearly are partial meanings. Um, another partial meaning uh, which starts again in this very early stage is by, and this was documented by Melissa Bauman many years ago, um, and initially she, would, she had a little finger puppet, so she was, you know, waggling her finger at her, her daughter with this finger puppet on it and saying by, and the child picked up by as being something you said when you saw the finger puppet. It didn't matter what context. But then uh, the child started to, to see that by was relevant when the mother was standing in the doorway with the finger puppet. Um, and, and so uh, 
you know, this came, became associated with any doorway, indoor doorways, not the front door or the back door. Um, and it wasn't until some months later that the child seemed to map the by onto this waving when someone left the house. So this took quite a long time to, to get extended. Not at all clear the child really realized that by was a greeting at that point either, but that's another matter. So what we've got is early partial meanings often tied to very specific contexts. Um, and uh, in general, each child gradually got extended to other contexts and then, in most cases, replaced by the conventional term that adults would use for that event type, which was the term that the adults run were actually using. So, partial meanings like these in production are incomplete when compared to the relevant conventional meanings that you would find in adult production, but at the same time, notice they are all extremely readily interpreted in context. Um, that is, the adults around the child can use all sorts of contextual cues to interpret these as the child clearly intended. Um, other terms that are commonly produced at first with only a partial meaning include pronouns. Firstborn children, characteristically up to about age two and a half, will, when they start to use I and you, use I for the adult and you for the child. This, of course, does not work because these are shifters. Um, but they will say things like, you broke it, can I mend it? You know, clearly <laughs> holding up a toy. Um, this clearly doesn't work. Um, <laughs> interestingly, if children are second born and are seeing an older sibling interacting with the rest of the family, um, they get the fact that these shift uh, apparently from the start. So um, clearly what you're exposed to very directly in usage helps you get these um, sorted out. Demonstratives are extremely limited in children's first uses. There tends to be used for completion of an action, so the child builds up several blocks, puts on the top one, the adult says there, and the child adopts there for completion of various small tasks. That typically point, accompanies pointing, and it's any object of interest. So the child points at a shop window uh, and says that. And the parent usually obligingly, if they say that as well as point, uh, supplies them with, you know, yes, that's a doll, or that's a coat, or whatever it is. Um, and so <coughs> that is used primarily for objects of interest, um, or the object that the child is requesting. Um, and interestingly, they don't get any of the contrast between this and that, or here and there, um, and established until around age four. And there they, then they get here and there, as here being near the speaker and there being away from the speaker. This and that is a little bit later, usually about eight months to a year later. Um, and so uh, getting these terms in the lactic space uh, sorted out for a language like English um, takes them quite a bit of time. Um, another term we might want to call have, say has a partial meaning, um, although now we're sort of on the edge of this, is uh, children's uses of the verb do, main verb do. Um, so at 1-3, putting a knee on the table, do that? No, not on the table. Um, or 1-3-6, so just a, a couple of days later, standing at the top of the stairs, ball in hand, do that? The mother said yes, and he usually threw the ball downstairs. Um, the next day, at breakfast, um, hid a cork under an open film cassette box. You may not all know what an open film cassette box <laughs> is, but um, <laughs> it's a small plastic box, right, with a lid you can unscrew. Um, and he said, do that, do that, do that. Um, hid the cork underneath it and then lifted it up and say, there. And then a few minutes later, held the cork above his cereal bowl. Do that. <laughs> and before anyone could say anything, dropped it into the milk. Um, but later on, started to, to um, use it more in a more focused way, where you got more contextual information from the other words he was using. So uh, reaching for the hairbrush, me do brush, wanting to brush his own hair. So these sort of very general uses of, of main verb do uh, turn up in most children. So another child, one night, any time he was playing with a new object, he would say, roddy do. Um, that is. Putting door. Yeah. 
Um, oops. Lost. Okay. Um, and you get uh, cases, another child under two, watching someone spin in library rooms, and baby do it, um, mama do it. Um, another child, two, two, um, indicating which toy the adult should get, you do that. Um, or wanting, or having turned off the tape recorder, said, uh oh, I did. He wasn't meant to touch the, the buttons on the tape recorder. Um, wanting a music box to play, the clown do. Here you'd have to know that it was one of these music boxes that had a little clown that danced, and you wound it up with a key, and then the clown would dance as the music played. Um, and so the clown do is pretty opaque to someone who didn't know that. Um, but once you have that context, um, then it is clear. So. Much less clear uh, is a case that many people might have thought of and said, oh, well, what about overextensions, which are extremely common up to age two, two and a half in children. Um, in production, for instance, children will use ball, a word like ball to refer to balls, doorknobs, lamps, round ones, uh, cakes of soap, the moon, apples, oranges, basically anything round. Um, but it turns out if you check up on that same child's comprehension and say, show me the ball, and you've got an array of pictures, they will pick out only the picture of the ball. Um, and then you can also go on and ask, you know, show me the moon, show me an apple, uh, show me the soap. Sometimes the child will get it, sometimes they just won't choose. So, um, so that suggests that we also have to deal with the fact that in comprehension, children are usually far ahead of what they're doing in production. And most of the examples of partial meanings I've given you up to now have been in production. So the question is, when the child overextends something like ball to refer to a doorknob, um, is that a partial meaning? What you could say is it's a strategy for communicating because I can't retrieve or I don't yet know the word for doorknob, but I have something which may be good enough. Um, and that, I think, is what the children are doing from a pragmatic point of view. And that's what we need to uh, be very careful about when we look at something like an overextension. Um, so, although the patterns of use when children talk often appear to involve partial meanings, in comprehension, the meanings they have established by that point uh, often are more complete and often closer to adult usage. But there are indeed still partial meanings. But in comprehension, children, of course, like adults, can rely on physical and conversational context and make use of various kinds of non-linguistic information uh, when they're communicating face-to-face. -face. They use gaze, facial expression, um, head gestures, manual gestures. Um, and their fast mapping results in first assignments of thought some meaning to a new word when they encounter it in context. And you could say they have various kinds of mapping strategies where we can be more specific and say, unfamiliar objects attend to the shape. Unfamiliar events or actions attend to changes in state, changes in location, and manner of location. And that will actually get you quite a long way just to, to start out. Um, and so both children and adults make a lot of preliminary inferences um, about the possible meaning for a word. And this can serve them quite well. Um, as children get older, they make, uh, actually I'm going to skip this, given, um, so, no I won't. Um, Two-year-olds, if they know the word dog, well I have to make another point here. Um, if they're told that some new kind of dog is a Dalmatian, they will Im immediately say it's a Dalmatian dog. So they assimilate the new word they've been given to the domain they've already got. So, you know, it's a kind, it's something that belongs in the domain dog. Um, and they keep dog as the head noun in these sorts of compounds. So you get contrast between house smoke and car smoke, plate egg and cup egg, that's fried versus boiled, um, and so on. And, and in fact, two-year-olds in English and in Swedish, in fact, all the Germanic languages, coin novel compounds like mad. Not in the Romance languages, not in Hebrew, um, but uh, in the Germanic, yes. Um, and like adults, children may do rather little more than identify various domains as they add words that belong, or that they're told belong there. Um, so they may learn a few names of trees, maybe not these ones, um, <laughs> a few names of dogs, um, a few terms to do with boats, if they sail with you, as um, our son did. Um, and one of the questions um, 
I've had for a long time is how do adults manage when faced with a term where they're only vaguely familiar, uh, when they know very little about the domain in question. And it turns out this is actually quite a common occurrence. Uh, most of us get by because we sort of slide over it and we don't maybe even realize how little we know about the actual meaning. Um, so uh, then we have to ask, is a partial meaning then enough for current purposes um, in Gricean terms uh, to interpret what the speaker intended? So if you consider someone who is on a boat um, and here's a speaker known to be knowledgeable about sailing, saying you need to hold on to the stay, the addressee could make various address, uh, con sorry, inferences in context. So they could say a stay must be something to do with sailing, that's obvious. No problem. Is it some kind of railing? I have to hold on to it. Is it something like a rope? Should I be pulling it in? Is it a support of some kind? Perhaps made of metal? Is it something that holds things in place? Um, well, you could say the stays on, I don't know how to make this work, but the stays are the standing wires that reach up to the top of the mast. They basically hold the mast in place on the boat. Um, so, you know, you could you could make an inference which would be not unreasonable, but it might not be right at all. Um, and you, if it's something that is critical, you're actually on the boat when this happens, you probably would say, what do you mean, what should I be holding on to? <laughs> Just to, in self-preservation, right? <laughs> um, so in adult language, just as an acquisition, we have to, we should realize that learning the conventional meaning is gradual, it's <coughs> incremental. We actually continue to do this on a lifelong basis. Um, and whenever we start acquiring knowledge about a new domain, we have to learn the relevant vocabulary for it. Um, many adults know only partial meanings in many domains. Um, I give a whole set of examples here. I'll let you read it fast, because I'm going on. Um, <laughs> a continuum in knowledge about word meanings goes from basically zero to expertise in any one domain with the degree of knowledge supported by the range of vocabulary you have, and intended on the contrasts in meaning that exist within each uh, uh, semantic field for that conceptual domain. Um, in some areas, adults may be relatively expert. Um, in others, um, they strongly resemble children. They rely on partial meanings for a handful of words that they happen to be familiar with. Um, let me give you some examples. Um, in talk about trees, many of us have partial meanings for stumble, some terms, but lack the relevant conceptual knowledge to distinguish the leaves of birch, ginkgo, rowan, laurel, and mulberry. Um, I wonder how many of you in this room could identify the different leaves that I have given you here. Um, the first one on the far side. You know the ginkgo. Okay, what about this one? Um, I've given you clues because I gave you the terms. <laughs> oh, I just give you the leaves for that. that. <laughs> this is a rower. That's a mulberry. That's a birch. Far one's a laurel. Um, so. <laughs> That's a leaf. <laughs> <laughs> they're all leaves, of course. And of course, we get by because there are all sorts of little hierarchies and sub hierarchies in a domain. I'm going to take another five minutes. <laughs> um, the same holds for many types of birds. So here. Cardinal, peewit, curly, waxwing, goldfinch. Um, in short, we need to know about a conceptual domain as well as the words for that domain before we can really assume a speaker is using the full meanings of the terms when we hear them in conversation. We may be familiar with the domain that a term belongs to, but we may lack conceptual knowledge about the relevant categories and subcategories in that domain and how they are organized with respect to each other. Um, and so we can only operate with partial meanings. And this essentially is Putnam's Elm Beach problem, which I've always been puzzled by because he, he says, suppose you're like me, can't tell an, an elm from a beach. We say the extension of elm in my idiolect is the same as the extension of elm in someone else's. There's the set of all elm trees, the set of all beach trees, the extension of beach in both our idiolects. But he's only talking about extension, notice. Elm in my idiolect has a different extension from beach in your idiolect, as it should. Is it really credible this difference in extension is brought about by some difference in our concepts? And the answer is yes, of course, because Putnam didn't know anything about trees. You know, and so uh, he's talking about extension, not talking about intention or thinking about the fact I've got two different lexical items here, they've got to mean something different. He's simply assuming that because he can't distinguish the extensions, that they're the same somehow. Um, and I don't know quite what he thinks about uh, how he differs from other people, but. Anyway, he clearly hasn't yet got 
the relevant knowledge about trees. Um, and this dependence on learning the relevant words for a new domain has been recognized, long recognized, in, for instance, a field like anatomy in medicine, um, where uh, they notice that how did the surgeon acquire his knowledge of the structure of the human body comes in part from a surgeon's first-hand experience during his long training. And what makes it work, this training work, is that he simultaneously is learning a highly specialized sub-language evolved for the sole purpose of describing this structure. The surgeon had to learn the jargon of anatomy before the anatomical facts could be effectively transmitted to him. So you're having to learn both the language for it and the domain, the conceptual domain at the same time. Um, and this is something I think that has been overlooked in a lot of the discussion, um, in linguistics at least, of uh, adult usage and children's learning. Um, and I'd like to suggest that we should contrast what I would call holistic versus gradualistic approaches to word acquisition. Um, in a holistic approach, you just take meaning as reference or extension, things learn all at once, um, and it's typical of most word learning um, studies in acquisition. And I should, as a little footnote, say uh, what's interesting is that if you look at some of the work by Horst and Samuelson, they checked up on children five minutes after they'd gone through a word learning study and found that there was nothing there. Um, uh, uh, they then did a, a, a new set of word learning studies and checked up 24 hours later, absolutely zero. So is that really telling us about word learning? I don't think so. Um, uh, and um, gradualistic approaches where meaning is the sense or the intention of a word with added inferences in context adjusted over time. Um, these may remain partial meanings, they're incomplete for quite a long time, but this is what, once children have got representations for these started up, then at a certain point they can start to draw on them in production as well, to use them to make definite references. Um, and so what each person understands is going to depend on the degree of knowledge possessed and shared with others. Some people know more about a domain than others, these are sort of obvious points, uh, but I think it's something that we need to think about when we talk about meaning. Um, skim that fast. <laughs> um, so we need to track how much of meaning is enough for current purposes. For the addressee trying to interpret the speaker's intended meaning in context, um, when we are talking about meanings, whether for adults or children. Um, and I'm going to skip to the conclusion. We basically all possess graded knowledge of word meanings, on a par with our graded knowledge about conceptual domains. And in this respect, as adults, we rely on partial meanings, in many cases, uh, in much the same way that young children do, who are just trying to set up their lexicon to start with. Thank you.